I'm Claire Howard. I'm the Blenton's Assistant Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art, and I was the Managing Curator for Making Africa here at the museum. Making Africa challenges us to think in a less limited and limiting way about the continent of Africa, and I'm thrilled to have this fantastic lineup of panelists here to share their wide-ranging perspectives on creativity and the continent in the 21st century. I've asked each of our three speakers to give you a quick presentation on their own work, which will be followed by a panel discussion on the themes of making Africa, um, the themes that it engages, and the questions that it poses, with time for audience questions at the end. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker. Nosariyama Garrick is the creator, executive producer, and director of the award-winning documentary series My Africa Is, which is featured in Making Africa. My Africa Is follows changemakers in various cities across sub-Saharan Africa and is currently being developed for broadcast by the PBS World Channel. It has won accolades from the National Black Programming Consortium and garnered a Telly Award for Excellence in Film and the Cindy Award for Excellence in Reality Programming. Nosariyame is also a freelance producer creating TV for the likes of CNN, Showtime, Viceland, and the Travel Channel. Please join me in welcoming Nosariyame Garrick. Hi everyone, um, I'm Nosa Garrick, I'm the creator of My Africa Is. I'm very excited to be here and excited to talk to you guys, um, particularly because the Making Africa exhibit has been going around for a number of years now and it's my first time actually seeing it. Um, and I was talking to Mukar about it earlier and it really is a time capsule of uh, the years between 2012 and 2014, it feels like, where there was this explosion of art um, um, from the African continent, and certainly art that was trying to find a voice and trying to find a platform um, because there was such a lack of representation, which I believe is why a lot of us artists decided to uh, put our work together. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of an introduction of, to My Africa Is. Um, I'm Nigerian, grew up in Nigeria, moved to New, uh, D.C. I see a Nigerian here, of course. Um, moved to D.C. when I was 14, um, and from there I didn't really have a lot of exposure to Nigerian culture, to Nigerian art, to Nigerian film. Um, and the only thing I did see was negative um, headlines in the press, from wars to famine to poverty. Um, and it made me go, wait, but that's not what I remember, that's not how I remember growing up. Um, obviously with the understanding that there's various realities on the continent, but it only seemed that the negative ones were the ones represented. Um, and even more so found out, be, living in the US, um, how insular it could be and how um, little people knew, um, not from their own fault, but just from the lack of information that was out there. Um, and so I moved back to Nigeria when I was, um, I'm not gonna give my age. I moved back to Nigeria in 2010, and what I saw and the people I met were young, amazing, inspiring change makers, and I felt like why not share their stories? And more than just write about it, why not tell those stories visually? Um, which is how My Africa is came about. So this is a video I'm just gonna play real fast, which was kind of like our Kickstarter slash sizzle for My Africa is. Could I get your first thoughts about the African continent? I don't know much about it. I would like to know more. I know about some human rights violations and some wars and genocide. Most of Africa yeah. is poverty. Yeah. Other than that, really. Yeah. Ignorance to Africa. Yes. Much. Yeah. My Africa, quite frankly, is the future. My Africa is connection and creativity. Africa is the place to be. I will experience it in game 
development is self-taught. I think it's what we call Google University. For me, I think it's very important for my children to understand that women can do anything that men can do. Actually, we are Swahili hard rock band. That's who we are, and we are proud of that. Even people hear some of our music, and we don't tell them it's our music. They, they think it's West. It's West. It's like, you know, and when you tell them it's our music, they're like, no, you're joking, man. <laughs> The beginning of my journey took me to Lagos, um, which is where I encountered Kunle Adiemi, whose work is also featured in the exhibit. And he was putting together um, a floating school to address sustainability um, and flooding, which is inevitably going to happen to most coastal cities around the world due to climate change. Um, and his story was fascinating uh, because this was a piece of, it was, it was basically a triangular shaped base of wood that was covered with um, solar panels on the side. And it was like, it seemed like a no brainer, but it just was something that didn't exist. And he was providing the solution that would not only service Nigeria, but could service other countries. And one of the things that we found in making the series and in talking to all these people was, how many similarities there were between one African city to the next as far as like environment or um, some of the dynamics of living in the cities and infrastructure issues. Um, and it just felt like there was so much space to share all of this and having this knowledge be out there was something that others could gravitate to and find solutions for their own issues there as well. Um, and he led us on a journey taking us to Makoko, which is a place that I didn't realize I drove past for years when I was going to school. Um, and it was a city that was um, built on stilts. And um, there's a community of over, I think it's about 300,000 people living there. Um, and this was a place that went widely ignored by a lot of Lagosians who were kind of just driving past and you know ignoring it. Um, and he brought the solution to the city, which has now become a place that tourism has, it has attracted tourists who are coming to see the city. Um, and this was a project that started, I believe it was in 2013 that it was, it, it was finally um, launched. And he just inspired us to want to see what else was there. And his project has then been taken around the world and that he just had something open up in China. Um, and then we met the we cyclers who are coming up with a solution for recycling waste. In Nigeria, where we have a huge problem with plastics that clog gutters, um, and she had created a, um, she created we cyclers, which was a point system which gave value to waste. Um, and across the African continent, plastic is an issue. And the waste of plastic and throwing plastics into gutters and clogging gutters is something that anyone could have, you know, any African country could relate to. And she was able to actually make connections in Dakar to try to create a similar program. And then we met um, WOLAB, which is a lab in Togo um, that was coming up with solutions or basically a maker space that allowed people to come and create. And so um, Doji Honu right here created a 3D printer using recycled materials that he had pulled from dumpsters across uh, Lume. Um, and so these were just, you know, it just blew my mind that these were stories that people were having a hard time finding what the get was or what the angle was. I'm like, they're doing amazing shit. What do you mean? 
Um, and so we just wanted to continue to push that forward. I also ran into Lakion Gumbanwan, whose photography is amazing and was pushing um, the idea of gender and what it meant, especially in um, the African context, where it can be seen as, you know, there's a very uh, monolithic thought of what it means to be a man and that of what it means to be a woman. And he was blurring those lines with his imagery. Um, and I just found my, my Africa is to be a platform where we got to spread these stories and share these stories to people who wouldn't have known, um, but also go across the genres that people thought were African. Um, we met the surfers in Dakar, um, where I wouldn't have known that unless I'd been there myself. Um, but we found a space where there are individuals who were really good and could have been com competitive or been sponsored, but because there's this like lack of um, interest or lack of knowledge um, of the surf community in Dakar, it just went undercovered. And the idea behind doing something as like surfing was to kind of, what I felt was lacking was the humanity of the people living on the continent. I think that we saw the continent as headlines, as issues, as charity cases, but we didn't actually understand the people living there had interests that mimicked our, mimic your own, you know, because they're individuals. Their drive mimics others. And I wanted to bring the humanity back to what, or as far as I was concerned, um, a humanity that was lacking. Um, these were voters in Ghana in 2012 who were young people who were pushing for elections to mean something and for them to be free and fair. Um, and we did a feature with them where we spoke with um, some of the leaders behind Ghana Decides, which was a program which was kind of like Rock the Vote. Um, and it was getting young people to go out there and vote. Um, and so now, um, I've been living in the US, I've been working on my Africa, but living in the US, and, and things have kind of shifted um, as far as, you know, at the time it was the Obama administration. Um, and so my idea was like, you know, we're so progressive, we're moving forward, everything's great. You know, people see Africans in the, in the continent, it's like, it's, you see Obama, so that's our representat uh, representation. But then, Trump happened, um, and, you know, I just realized how much, while I was talking about the African continent and how much people stood to find in the African continent, I wasn't actually talking about what it meant to live here as an African person, as an African artist. Um, and so my work since my Africa is while we're, while we're in development, um, I've been kind of pivoted and looking at the immigrant experience here um, in the US. Um, and proof of that is in a short that hasn't been released, so you guys are special. Um, and it's of um, an artist living in Brooklyn, who some of you might be familiar with his work. I, I fell in love with art, like from the first day. You know, I would read up and just get fascinated by, by art in, you know, lines and patterns and stuff like that. Born to Nigerian parents, we know that you know doing art was frowned upon. My dad is, is is an attorney, and my dad drove me around town and showed me different artists, you know, living on the trees and they're very poor. I was just like, no, I don't want to be like these people. So I just picked up my form and I filled in law first and second choice. Every day I would fall into like traps of daydreams or traps of trying to make art. It was just time. I mean, it was just time, so there was no turning back. My parents, they didn't talk to me for a while. My mom was in, was in touch with me, but my dad was just like, what are you doing? I've always loved Brooklyn from the movies, you know? Walking through the city, you, you pretty much can feel the vibe of your ancestors who have come before you. Pretty much this, this, this country, you know, was built on the backs of slaves. 
I've never ever, nobody has ever called me black before until I moved to the United States. It becomes a struggle whether you like it or not. When I'm drawing, it's like drawing in code, it's a tennis story. I believe art is not an end to itself. It can be used to translate ideas. You can put it on anything. You can tell stories anything. You can move the world with art. Afro Mysterious is a name I, I coined in 2007. It means the mystery of the African thought pattern. Every pattern you find, there are mysteries. Now, I take some of these patterns from the different works of Yoruba mythology. A lot of the masks, a lot of the markings of the mask, the waves, different triangles and swirls, and, you know, all those things, they have different elements and different relationships as it comes to different orishas, for example. When I'm drawing, it's like drawing in codes, it's a tennis story. I've found a way to actually be able to apply that in different forms and areas of art when it comes to fashion, it comes to talking about social justice, it comes to talking about anything I want to talk about. I can actually code them in this pattern. I would say I'm lucky to be alive at this point because trust me, a lot of people have come way before me and I've been like trying to break this ice for, for way longer and they are made fun of and they're gonna accept it. You know, with this art now, I find power to be able to express myself and actually also lead other people, also tell their own stories, you know, you know, so I find myself as a, as a bridge, as an educator. It's, it's a unique spot to be. I'm just excited, you know, for the future and I'm just happy to be doing what I'm doing right now. I've never felt more alive in my life. My name is Laolu Shebanjo, also known as Laolu NYC. My Africa is now. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, in conclusion, <laughs> um, you know, I think that between, from, from making Africa to now, there's been a lot of change into, as to how people look at the African continent, but there's so much more room to explore, so many more stories to tell. Um, stories that stem from the continent, but also stories of the African people living in the United States and living all over the world. I mean, I think that there's so many more realities that we've yet to explore. Mine is one of a very, this, it's just one very individual experience, and these artists are very individual. If you think about the mass of stories that are still waiting to be told, um, it's gonna be, you know, it's a lot of, lot of content there. Um, and so I'm just excited to be a part of it and even more inspired after seeing all the works um, that were made up a part of the exhibition and extremely proud uh, to be one of the artists that was included in the exhibit um, at a time where we were kind of looking for inspiration um, and looking for ourselves in a space where we, it didn't seem like we existed. So I look forward to creating and I, Hope you guys look forward to sh looking into the work as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nosa. Our next speaker is Wale Oyajide. He's a designer, writer, musician, and lawyer, and the founder of the fashion label Akiri Jones, which is featured in Making Africa. Through his work as the brand's creative director, textiles and accessories designer, and writer, he employs fashion design as a vehicle to celebrate the perspectives of marginalized populations. While I is a TED Fellow, an Open Society Foundation's Moving Walls Fellow, and a National Geographic Explorer. His apparel design can be seen in the Marvel Studios film Black Panther, and has been shown in exhibitions at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Tel Aviv Museum of Art, and the Fowler Museum at UCLA, in addition to Making Africa. He's also a recording artist and producer and has collaborated with Jay Dilla and MF Doom, among others. And for what it's worth, Esquire Magazine has named him one of the best dressed men in the United States of America. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Wale Oyajide. <laughs> Those were all lies. <laughs> so, I, I call myself a designer, an artist. I think these are all very big 
important words that can be intimidating to people, I think for the most part what I do, what I attempt to do can be summed up as being a storyteller, which is something I think everyone in this room is and has the capacity to be and generally wants to be. Um, I started off as a musician several years ago making everything from indie rock to Afrobeat to hip hop, all as a form of expression, all as a way to kind of get my word and point of view across. I ended up retreating into a career of law, which seems very common for immigrants and Africans who are trying to please their parents, apparently. Um, it didn't take. I think I often say that there are things you can do and then there are things that you're made to do. So I could certainly be a capable, moderately intelligent attorney, or I could be somebody who excelled at speaking to and for populations who had not been shed light upon. And I think so many of us, whether we be Africans, people of color, LGBT populations, South Asians, people of Arab descent, those of us who have been come to the West or been brought to the West against our own will, have found that we don't see ourselves represented in ways that we recognize. We tend to not see our parents, our brothers, lovers, sisters, cousins, those that we recognize and respect in popular culture. So everything from the movies, to the music that we watch, to the museums that we are uh, privileged to visit, rarely represent the excellence and beauty that we know that we, can, we uphold. And so I think a lot of the work that I've set out to create, which button works that one, has been the, within the idea of kind of showing the multifaceted experiences that we all have and that we are familiar with. So while these stories of, you know, you say the word African and they're very stark images that come to mind, no matter where you're from, no matter if you were raised there or not, we tend to think of the big Fs, the wars, the famines, the fatigue. That may certainly exist within a portion of our realities, but as, as our friend said, there's so much more to us. And so I think for those of us who are able to break in and have a podium to stand behind, many of us make an effort to kind of crack the window open a little bit brighter, just to show more of the scope, more of who we are, more beyond the despair, because there is so much more to us. And so my work is very much an expression of just the idea of potential that all of us hold. And I think it's not, I certainly come from the perspective and angle of being somebody of African descent, but I think it's absolutely a global message and a global approach. I just happen to kind of work with what I know best, which is people who look like myself, but it's something I take across the globe and something I recognize everywhere. And fashion has been a fascinating medium for this method because it's something that we all have to wear. Um, you generally can't walk around nude. And yet, it's something that has been so insidious and powerful in our society as a divider, as a separator. You're not wearing Gucci, you're not wearing Saint Laurent, you're not wearing whatever. Therefore, you are less than I am. But we're all wearing clothes, so what does that mean? It's to the point where we will pay more for the exact same garment because it gives us a sense of comfort, even though we have the same degree of actual warmth and comfort wearing the same sweater as Zara versus Hermes. Feels the same but you feel better because you paid more. And so the idea of, for me, using a very universal, you know, clothing is as common as breathing, as air and water, as this necessary as bread for all of us. And so you use something that everybody can relate to on some level and use it as a way to not divide, but a way to uplift. And that's kind of been what I've been trying to attack and examine for the past several years. Um, so yeah, that's a really flatter way of saying I run a fashion brand. And <laughs> Maybe buy my clothes if you think they look cool. Um, but it's, it's really interesting because it's a way of showing that, again, generally you flip through a, a Vogue magazine or a GQ, what have you. Things have gotten a bit more progressive as of late, but in general, people of color are at best canvases for other people's ideas. Um, it's very, very rare. You know, you might flip through a Vogue and see a bunch of gorgeous black models or South Asian models, but then you look at the masthead and who's, where's the editor, who's writing, who's the photographer. And it's, it's great to have like, you know, again, we're all working on it. This is like a global process, but I think the more that we are deliberate and, and have intent um, in the way we create anything, the more inclusive we all are to each other as this room looks inclusive, the better product, the better content, the, whatever phrase you want to use, the better stories we hear because they're, not only universal, but they have wider points of view. 
And so I make an effort to certainly come from a perspective of somebody who has my background, but also be very aware that we're speaking to the world. And it's not intended to be exclusive in so much as it is informative from a certain perspective. Um, oh yeah, and then this thing happened recently. Um, it's like a little known independent film a few people saw. It didn't do terribly well at the box office, but nevertheless, if you can find it at a blockbuster. It's called Black Panther. Um, they reached out to me, and I say this because to me it's a testament for when you have conviction behind your art, your vision, your writing, whatever it is that you happen to do, we all do something. You do it long enough, you do it well enough, you become the guy or the lady or the person who does this thing. And you, you hone your craft, you sharpen your tool at the anvil, and you have a very set point of view. And so when the day comes that a billion dollar corporation wants to make a film that happens to speak to what it is that you make, you're the one that they call because you're the one who's doing it honestly. And I say you because that's all of us in some shape or form. Um, I'm not gonna talk about, we all, most of us, some of us have seen it so you have an idea of what it's about. But I think for me what was important, I was gonna do it because it's Marvel, but I would have done it anyway because it's a story that showed us in the way that I was familiar with. Yes, they were wearing spandex and like doing superhero things, but they were also looking like the parents that I revere, the intelligent uncles, people like the great Muyo here, people who I know are, are luminaries and visionaries that I've known, but I've rarely seen on the big screen. And so when the moment arises, when a big company wants to tell this story, whether or not it's for financial gain or not, it's a fantastic gift to the universe, to all of us, because we're getting to see us in a way that enough people have not seen us. Um, and so again, returning back to being the idea of being a creator, I think it's having a sense of kind of confidence in where it is that you come from. So if you know that you come from people who are proud and beautiful and intelligent, there's no fear in telling that story because even if it's not on a big screen yet, you'll take it there. And if somebody beats you to the punch and their name is Disney and Marvel, fine. <laughs> not gonna complain. Um, so, the mission continues, and I think for me, it's really, it's always been within the expression of showing people who I recognize in, in the best possible light. And what's particularly interesting to me is to cast individuals who are, for lack of a better phrase, real people. So I certainly use professional models on occasion, but it's a lot more interesting to me to cast friends of mine, and more importantly, I like to cast migrants and refugees. I mean, I think we are, this has been a global story, and it's certainly appeared in the, in the headlines more recently for reasons we don't need to get into. But the idea of migration is such a universal and human story. Um, and we don't see as many migrants from the global south in the US, but in Europe in particular because of proximity. Um, people from Syria, people from Nigeria will make the arduous journey across deserts in the hands of people smugglers and then across the Mediterranean. And all sorts of magical, magical things can happen to them on the way there. And so for me, these are stories that we often, if we don't see them in the headlines because we're not in Italy, we care about them in the periphery of our experiences. And we think of them in very stark terms. Again, you think of them in the terms you think of Africa generally. So it's tragedy, it's sadness, it's starving people, it's drowning bodies in the water, all things that have a degree of truth to them, but we don't think of them as what they ultimately are, which is people. And importantly, we don't think of them as us, which is what if we haven't been migrants, many of us will be, or our children might at some point. That's just a reality of climate change and the way the world is going. Um, migrants are doctors, scientists, seamsters, musicians. They are ordinary people who have had to leave. And a, a friend of mine coined the phrase in his talk recently, nobody leaves home unless if home is the mouth of a shark. Like Nobody's coming here because they want to take your job. They're coming here because they don't have one, and they have children, importantly. And so that's why they're here, just as you would be here, because this is the land of opportunity, as we've sold it. So, you know, be careful how you market yourself, because you might attract <laughs> those who, oh, Nike is great, I want to wear a Nike shoe. If America is the Nike of the world, we're coming to experience your beautiful product. Um, I digress. So, yeah, the idea is these people are people, um, and it will shock you to find that if you stand in a room of, of random migrants, a few of them will not only be very talented and brilliant, they will be like stunningly gorgeous too. 
And so this is a gentleman from Guinea who's been spending some time trying to find asylum in Sweden. Um, last week he spoke, he was in Italy. We shot this in Rome. When we met him at the train station, it was myself. I, I traveled with a small team because, again, this is not like an anthropological thing, so I'm not going to take a giant camera crew. It's very intimate because these are people who generally have suffered and we want to treat them with respect, but they're also people. We're at the train station in Florence, just like four black dudes out of like no other black dudes. Um, and an armed guard walks up to us just because, of course, why would he not? And so these are, this is not an unfamiliar narrative anywhere in the world, but it's the idea that people look at you and they assume things, rightly or wrongly. A few minutes later, he's wearing these things, and people come up to me and they go, oh, are you Jay-Z, are you Kanye West? For those who don't know, this guy looks nothing like Jay-Z or Kanye West. Um, yes, and more to the point, we live in a world, and we always have, in which the way you present yourself is the way that people assume your standard of merit happens to be. So this is a person who has, or who had at the time, no like legal standing to be in the nation. Um, he was working to find tangible work, and a few minutes before he'd been profiled, but then he looks like this, and he is assumed to be like royalty, basically. And so what does that mean? What is the worth of what we wear? And, and this is, these are the kind of things I try to examine. And so all of a sudden, it's like the way you present yourself makes people think that you are more than you are. Or it makes people look at you as you should be looked at all the time. And so for me, it's not the argument that we should dress better. It's more about the viewer and the idea that we should look at each other and assume that we're seeing people at their highest possible light. And so we strip away all of this stuff, like strip away the very egotistical designer person behind a podium and just look at him as like a father who loves his child, who is concerned about how his parents are doing. That's a person. And that's a story that you are also familiar with because you probably feel similar things. And so the hope is that if we take enough pictures of people looking like this, instead of being starving and being sitting on boats drowning, we might begin to forget that skin tone is a different shade because that's arbitrary. Nobody chooses that. Um, and so for me, it's just ultimately seeing people and depicting people in ways that they want to be depicted. I mean, you go to a, a refugee camp, they struggle to get there. The last thing they want to do be, is be seen like half naked, begging for food, even if that's what they did that morning. It's like, give me a break. Like, I'm just like you do. I, you know, your mom wouldn't let you come in the house if your house was messed up. So why do you take pictures of these people exclusive pictures of these people, showing them at their very worst. I mean, and I think we often forget the effect this has on society. When you see these images over and over again, you get desensitized, and you forget that these are people, and importantly, you turn away because it's exhausting to see that much suffering. And so I kind of take the opposite approach. When you show them as being beautiful, as we all hope to be, it reminds you that this is somebody who perhaps needs help, but then this is what they could be if you offered a hand. Um, so, that's kind of my thesis to my approach. Also, I'm a designer, so buy my clothes. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. But my, my work um, shows up in tapestry design and clothing. Ultimately, it's always about telling a story. It's a way of showing the immigrant and migrant experience in different ways. So I happen to be a huge fan of classic re European fine arts. The things that we kind of see as the apex of beauty are things that I also aspire towards but it's just me kind of kicking the door and injecting people who look like me into those same shapes and same canvases. Because if my daughter walks into the Louvre, it's rare that she'll see a picture that looks like her, unless if somebody like me makes that picture. And I think we are kind of of that generation where that's beginning to happen, and we're very fortunate places like Making Africa and the Black Museum bring in more, for lack of a better phrase, diverse approaches to creating beautiful art. I think we're on the way. And it's just, it's just in the sense of making a more rich experience for those of us who consume and create art. The idea that no story should be told untold and no voice should be ignored because we all have something to contribute to the tapestry of the human experience. Um, so yeah, this is what I make. It's fashion, but fashion really is just a means to an end. 
it ultimately is the story of us um, and us being everybody in this room, regardless of background, ethnicity, gender, or preference. It's the human experience. Thank you. Thank you, Wale. Um, our last speaker is Mukhtara Youssef. Mukhtara Youssef is a Yoruba Nigerian Muslim visual artist, scholar, cultural activist, and designer, currently working between Austin and Lagos. Her work focuses on decolonizing design, sustainability, alternative economies, and design in the global south. Her creative art practice explores links between issues of trauma, black mental health, and Afrofuturism by exploring larger conceptual motifs of colonial time, indigenous epistemology, and material counter-memory. Please join me in welcoming Mutari Youssef. Hello. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I'm really excited. Um, just to talk honestly about African design, because it's uh, what I love. Everything from fashion to furniture to product design. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful to be here. So I'm going to actually read um, for most of my presentation, because I am kind of a... Um, more used to doing this stuff as, a, as an academic. So my name is Mukhtara Youssef, and I describe myself as a visual artist, a scholar, and a designer. And that's really because what I love to do and what is so important to me is being able to look at things from a bunch of different angles. So um, as a scholar, I write and theorize about the politics behind design and how we might make it better. As a visual artist, I create work that captures the complex and largely intangible structures and feelings we live with and within. And as a designer, I try to make those things more tangible and attempt to create solutions to the problems that they pose. So this, po this piece is a, um, a work that I did in 2016 called Okan Apiku. It's a project that I did, um, a textile and, and clothing project where I explored the Yoruba concept of Abiku. Abikus are people who are born to die. And if they make it past infancy, they spend their life on the brink of death, navigating the liminal space between the world of the beyond and the earthly. Through the project, I employed the use of personal narrative, waste, indigenous design silhouettes, and textile de design to create a piece that not only has a story embedded into it, but starts to ask important questions about the nature of design, fashion design, and what it says about our being. The project was one of discovery, where I uncovered the ways the concept of Abiku, this historic indigenous concept, could be used to, um, to be applied to critical studies of queerness as well as disability. Often when a designer is creating a fashion designer, they um, are asked to think so much about their user, their subject, or in women's fashion design, their girl. Um, you might hear designers describing their audience, desired audience, and being asked, who's your girl? Who is the DVF girl? Who is the Dior girl? And that's really meant to describe the lifestyle and the ways of being that these clothings are meant to provide for. In a similar way, through this project, I wanted to rethink subjectivity altogether. Our democratic post-colonial world, despite its attempts to consider difference, has often turned diversity into a matter of keeping everything the same except for color, rather than really considering the entire ways in which we might exist um, might be different, that we might actually have whole ontological ways of being and existing in the world that contrast each other completely. Mass production and assumptions about who the masses actually are creates a world of many universal design assumptions about ability, for example, that we see in our doors, um, our chairs, and how our screen devices are designed. 
And this brings me to the greatest challenge that I have and continue to address as a designer. How do we create a universe based on plurality? How do we approach design from a perspective of systems, one that goes beyond the intention of diversifying representation visually, and instead ask how we can create diverse representation through function and through production? How do we create whole new systems of relating and engaging that represent those typically unrepresented? The, un the willingness and capacity of African societies and minds all over the continent to adapt is a profound one featured throughout the Making Africa exhibition. But how often has it been thought of that we shouldn't have to? That the digital world, for example, is a, is a great example of how um, of, of how Africans have been able to crack open and expand um, a space that was never necessarily meant for them. We can look, for example, at keyboards that we still use today um, in their QWERTY uh, setups made for no other language than English. Google's next billion users include several countries of the global south, including Nigeria, where people speak and use more than one language in their daily life. Will the UX um, be adapted to be more inclusive of the realities of these users? Will it account for their vast differences in worldview, or will it continue to be, as it has, a means of globalization that is largely one-sided? These are the types of things I think about as a designer. As I've continued to imagine and ask what kinds of worlds might be created for, my work has grown and expanded into site-specific work in Nigeria. Over several months, I created installations reflecting on the Lagosian landscape using interactive technology, family heirlooms, and mo motifs from Yoruba spiritual practice. I observed, upcycled, and played with the possibility of new textiles by considering, as my ancestors did, what the land has to offer. I was faced with the challenge and opportunity to use what most considered trash, viewing it now as an abundant resource. Through weaving my family craft, furniture making, assemblage, I asked myself how might a historic way of thinking and interacting with the world around us be used to solve new problems. I believe the future of African design has moved beyond a desire to be seen and moved into um, a seeing of ourselves. I was lucky enough to start creating during a time where so many people had come before me and were making you know, wonderful works of representation that pushed inclusivity, where I had more options of being able to see myself in spaces that I hadn't previously. Um, and what's happening now, at least I believe, is that we are able to see ourselves more and more. And in that seeing of ourselves, there has been a desire to create new ways of engaging and creating. In my work, that has meant um, expanding the tradition of waste reuse, which we see all over the African continent and within the exhibit itself, into a reconsideration of how waste is understood altogether. I believe that waste is simply a name we call something whose capacity we have yet to discover. My current project, Excess Nothing, seeks to disrupt this process by asking not only which materials have been wasted, but what knowledge forms, what people, what ways of relating to one another. Um, my favorite creators, of course, are doing the same. Uh, Labake Lagos is a brand, a fashion brand in Lagos, Nigeria, which um, recently premiered at this past Lagos Fashion Week and is seeking to address the issue of secondhand clothing that is a problem all over the African continent and asking really, really hard questions like, if and how it's possible for us to make zero waste collections, and how do we create um, you know, appealing uh, and attractive and interesting 
clothing options that come from trying to deal with this issue of this abundance of imported secondhand fabrics. Designer Consociates is a consultancy within Lagos as well that is working to create more conscious ideas of, of, of fashion and create a more conscious consumer. This past Lagos Fashion Week for the second year in a row, they took on um, the heavy task of collaborating with existing Nigerian luxury designers and creating ready to wear clothing that were produced in Nigeria, um, but that also use su sustainable dyes and, um, and fabrics. And lastly, possibly my favorite is uh, Zashadu Bags. Zashadu Bags is a luxury handbag company in Lagos, Nigeria as well that um, creates from this really holistic and, and deep uh, commitment to artisanal style of creation, but that also has a deep, um, a deep commitment to equitable labor and provides housing and healthcare for all of their employees. So that's what I have to share today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maktara. I'd now like to invite our panelists to take their seats on the stage for a conversation with Moyo Okadiji. Professor Okadiji teaches art history here at UT Austin and is also an artist and curator. He was previously curator of African and Oceanic Art at the Denver Art Museum and has exhibited his own work at venues including the New Museum of Contemporary Art New York, the Smithsonian Institution Washington DC, the Corcoran Center London, and the National Museum Gallery in Lagos. He is the author of books and exhibition catalogs including African Renaissance, Old Forms, New Images, and Yoruba Art, and The Shattered Gourd, Yoruba Forms in 20th Century American Art and I'll let him take it from here. Please welcome Moyo Okadiji. It's uh, really wonderful to be here today to uh, be with uh, these incredible artists. Uh, I, I feel really it's a big opportunity for me to uh, moderate this discussion with uh, uh, this generation of artists, which is really uh, a generation uh, younger than mine. Uh, uh, and I, I am so happy that uh, this is happening because um, um, my generation really um, is one that has created enormous, enormous problems for this generation. <laughs> and um, one of the things um, you will notice um, when many of them talk is, I started out as a lawyer, or as an engineer, or as a medical doctor, when really what I wanted to, to be is an artist. And first, they would have to satisfy us first before they can even begin to think about who they are, what they would like to do, and uh, uh, eventually find a way to, um, to themselves. And um, uh, on behalf of my generation, I would like to apologize. <laughs> can you call my parents? I'd like to apologize, um, but um, I would also like to say that uh, it is not entirely our fault. Um, there's a story that has not been told um, concerning my generation, and um, I, I think even when I say it, those who are within that same time period as myself, would, would be startled to hear me say it, that we are a generation that was locked up. We were locked up from the age of maybe 10 
maybe 11, and locked up till about 19, most of us, in places of disinformation, in spaces of disinformation, in which a lot of things were loaded into us. Um, and when I say locked up, uh, we basically were taken from our parents, or let me put it this way, our parents were convinced that the best thing they could do for us was to put us in these spaces uh, for during the formative years. And um, um, in those spaces, they basically taught us things that we would not find useful. I, I wanted to show one uh, image, this, this work that is in the um, museum. It's, uh, it's a beautiful object that is made out of uh, these waste products. And um, in many ways, it is the story of Africa. The story of Africa in terms of the way in which these objects represent something that is not really there. Uh, because what it's really uh, mimicking is this object. Um, and in talking about this object, it's beginning to use materials that are available around because one, it was my generation that was supposed to have passed this down to them. Mm -hmm. But we failed. We failed because we were never given the opportunity to actually learn these things. We became alienated right on our own grounds. And uh, uh, if one were to compare, uh, OK. If one were to, th this, this is the same tradition that we were supposed to pass down to them, that we were told, we were convinced, these are not important things. Mm. These are things that belong to some primitive past. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are the things you need to abandon. <coughs> and uh, so finally, we ended up with uh, 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 the same tradition of using these really beautiful leathers to create uh, uh, patterns that are um, in many ways worthy of uh, sustaining life. Um, but can we see the next one? Uh, this is what we ended up giving, the opportunity we ended up giving to our own, the, our own children, basically, uh, to be using these improvised materials mm. to now refashion and re redefine themselves. And they have done enormously well. Uh, they have been incredibly brilliant to be able to find their way out of the, the cultural amnesia, mm -hmm. cultural erasure that we kind of have created for them. So I'm, 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 uh, I, I, I'm so delighted that uh, this is going on because uh, um, It's something that has happened despite us. My own situation is a little different. My father is a writer. He never stopped me from being an artist. Uh, he actually encouraged me to be an artist. And virtually every art school that I went to, I was always the first student. Um, and. Uh, uh, so that sense in which somebody was prevented from being an artist wasn't something I ever experienced. But I became an art historian largely because I realized that we now have these artists emerging and there is no one to tell their story. Somebody has to tell their story because if their story is not told, it's just as if they never existed. Um, so um, 
I more or less have had to sacrifice myself, sacrifice almost my own career to be able to do this. But um, one of the things that I realize as, uh, um, as an art historian is that the very title of this exhibition is so, uh, it's so appropriate, making Africa. Africa is like clay. Uh, you, it's something that is always being made. Uh, something that is very plastic, something that can easily adapt. And uh, uh, if you shape it in one way, it is still, it can still take a different kind of shaping. And it's always in the process of evolving. So it's so much, it's like, uh, it's like, a, it's like a drawing. You can keep changing it. Uh, like a painting, like a canvas, you can keep writing into it, and you can take it, and that is the the, the beautiful part of it. And my reading of of Africa is that uh, we are all immigrants in Africa, whether we leave the continent or we don't physically leave the continent. We are all immigrants. We are all um, on this migration, this journey of migration. And the journey of the immigrant can be defined in uh, three processes. In terms of exit, in terms of exile, and in terms of exodus. Exit is the moment in which you leave that space that is native to you. Exile is the, the period in which you begin to adapt yourself into the space to which you have emigrated. And the exodus is always necessary in the sense that the space of exile is not always the space that you anticipated you would be in. It surprises you in many ways. And you have to make a return. And that is the exodus. 